Hello, everybody. This is Birding by Ear, Bird Sounds of Lake Tahoe. I'm Rich Chambers, and the presentation is hosted by the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. So we're going to pick up where we lost and where we last left off in class three, and we will uh, start with the white crowned sparrow. Well, I take that back. We're going to start off with the class review. So I'd ask you to, uh, well, one other thing I'd like to try is make sure everybody's got the chat box running. So if you don't, move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and click chat. And then uh, send me a message so I can see that everybody's doing it. And you can use that to ask questions during the presentation or to make comments. Okay, I'm getting some good ones coming in. Good. All right, well, let's go ahead. So from last week, I asked you to know what I call the car starting warblers. So the Nashville warbler. So it's kind of a, the, the typical warbler seesaw and then followed by some lower pitch tunes. Okay. So that sounds uh, like some other warblers that we'll be listening to in a minute, but I wanted to go over again that uh, birds are individuals and so they don't all sound exactly the same. Some species are much better at being uh, exact about their songs and others are a little bit looser. So for the Nashville Warbler, we're going to listen to another uh, bird of that species and see if you can pick up that it sounds a little bit different, but still Nashville. So I don't want to confuse you, but uh, birds do not always sound exactly the same. And that will be uh, easier for you to pick up on than it sounds like. So essentially you're, you're eventually going to learn the sound of a bird and you'll know that it is sort of generally sounds like what you expect, but then you'll hear another, another bird of that species. It won't be exactly the same, but it has, sort of that same general impression of that species. So let's move on to Wilson Torbler. And another Wilson Torbler. So Lois asked about geographical differences making, uh, I, I, th I think she's asking, does that account for the minor differences in the way the song is sung? And yes, I say that, that uh, that's a good point. Uh, birds that are very close to each other are probably going to sound much more alike. But um, as they spread out in geography, then they sound more and more different, I think. So let's try the Magilla rays. Do you hear how slurry it is? That's one way I tell the difference. So 
So when I think of Megillah Brace, I think of a clear, clear whistles that followed the seesaw sound, which is slurry. And here's a, another Magella brace. All right, so do you get what I'm talking about, uh, about car starting? So it's kind of a mechanical sound like a starter makes. And then a separate sound that's when the engine starts or dies, either one. Whoops. So let's try that, see if you can hear the car starting. Okay, any questions on the warblers? All right, then for homework, I ask you to learn these. Fox sparrow, green-tailed towhee, and the lazuli bunting. And I have to admit, I have trouble with these still. And um, I'm gonna have to use a different technique to finally memorize these, I think other than just listening. So we'll go over some techniques in a bit. Fox Sparrow. So to me, this bird makes kind of a dipsy do sound in there. And that's one way I can tell, but I'm not, I don't think all fox sparrows are necessarily going to make that sound. Let's hear, let's listen for the dipsy do. Right there. So let's try another fox sparrow. And then the green-tailed towhee. Now those mewing sounds right there are very characteristic of the towhee. If he makes those sounds, then you're going to be pretty sure that's what it is. And then another green tail towhee. See, these two birds don't make exactly the same sounds, but uh, the general impression of the sound is still the same, I think. But again, that, that comes with experience to be able to pick up on that. And then the bunting. Now, um, I've latched onto something with this particular bird. I'm not sure it applies to all the bun lazuli buntings, but it seems to say yuli right at the end of uh, the phrase. See if you can pick up on that. Let's 
Let's listen to a different bunting. So do you see what I mean by the general impression? So I call this the general impression of tone and quality. And uh, these two are different birds and they do sound different, but once you get enough experience, you'll be able to see that uh, they, are, they are very similar. Again, it has to do with the tone and the quality of the song. So let's try the first one a little for just a bit. And the second one. So if you see what I mean by the general impression of tone and quality, that'll help you a lot, but uh, not until you've listened to them quite a bit. Let's see. Oh yeah. So picking up with our sparrows. Now let's listen again. It is a melodious, very, very good singers uh, with whistles, but the first whistle is a bit lower in tone. That's, that's a good clue. Okay, um, let's try just a bit of it again and listen for those series of whistles with the first one being lower in tone. All right, let's Let's get everybody to guess. What's this bird? It is part of the sparrow family. I'll bet you've heard that a lot. These are fairly common birds in the basin. I don't see any guesses, but let's try it again. Okay. Lois and Tim think it's the Junko. Okay, kind of a one noter type of bird with a trill. A trill again is a series of individual notes that happen so fast you can't actually count how many. Now the trill that the uh, the junco makes, pretty common sound that it makes, um, it can be easily confused with the chipping sparrow. In fact, at certain rates of repetition in the trill, they're they're very they're so similar it's pretty hard to tell them apart. Let's listen to a chipping sparrow. To me, it's a much drier, 
uh, sounds like a grasshopper or something almost. And then a dark eyed junco that sounds very similar. See, there's not a lot of difference, but there is some. And the junco again. So I have a lot of these in my house, so I hear that trill a lot around here. Very interesting little birds. One of them got into my office once when I opened the window to uh, fill up the feeders. So that was pretty exciting. He's flapping all over the place. So I opened the, up the window real wide, uh, taking a chance of getting yet another bird, but I was able to guide him out with the broom after a few, took about 30 seconds, I guess. And then uh, this year, same thing happened, but I had learned to keep the window almost all the way closed, but I got a bird in anyway. And this bird was just impossible for me to identify. Um, uh, it was a Vox's Swift, I'm, I'm convinced. I did, I chased it around for a bit and then it, then it disappeared. I thought, oh, well, it must've gone out the window. I just didn't see it, so I closed the window. Then I don't know, it's four or five hours later, I go go to bed and about the time I get into bed, this big thing flies right by me. So, oops, didn't get out. So I turn all the lights, open the window, and I chased it around with this broom trying to guide it out and he would not go out that window. It was an amazingly agile flying bird with really long swept back wings like, like the Swifts have. And uh, he could go around that broom just like a little u-shape right around it it was amazing so again it disappeared and i thought well i don't know what happened so i closed the window and i haven't seen it since and i hope i never do but uh, the problem with swifts is they don't perch on anything like a normal bird so they're going to be hanging on something and that's why i probably couldn't see it when it was in the room so let's guess at our next bird These are really beautiful birds, I think. So what do you think that is? The chup, that chup chup Z uh, is a real telltale for this bird. We have one guess for a green-tailed towhee. Well, you got to, we have the towhee part right, Bambi. Now the two noises that I think they make the most are the chup chup z and then another kind of a z sounding trill. Yeah, those two sounds. All right, what's well, our next member of the sparrow family? Whoops. <laughs> well, it's the green tailed toey. I think the mu notes are pretty uh, pretty diagnostic. Other birds do that, uh, but maybe not so much in our area. Let's see, the uh, Vesper Sparrow makes a sound that sounds like pew rather than mu, but somewhat similar. So let's listen again, see if you can pick out the whistled notes followed by short trills. Actually, at the end of the sparrows, 
So it's time for an extra credit bird or something anyway. Hint, it is a mammal. Don't see any guesses, but I know that when I moved up here, it's about eight years ago. Uh, Lois has it right. That's the, the Douglas Spur squirrel. And uh, I'll tell you, my yard, they could go on for what seems like hours making this sound. I think it's a type of warning sound, at least it seems that way to me, that when it sees me come out in the yard, they'll start making this noise. Now, a lot of bird walks I've been on, there's almost someone <laughs> who says, what bird is that? And I have to admit, I was uh, certainly confused at first because it does sound kind of like a bird. But it's not. So now you know it isn't. So you won't be uh, part of the party that says, what bird is that anymore? So they're pretty cute little things. And Lois says they're buried in the pine cones right now. Yes, I've noticed that. It's amazing to me how much they chew up of a pine cone. So that was the end of uh, the end of all the birds I had to present. So I thought we'd spend uh, some of the time that's left just reviewing the groups of birds. So I'm going to play the. It's kind of a. It's a set of birds that belong to this group. And the list of the set in order is listed here. You can see blue jay is first. Of course, that is an Eastern coast bird. Uh, the crow, the bagpie, and so on. So I'm gonna make a video of just this part of the class. I'm gonna make it available to you. So you'll actually have at least a small uh, selection of all the sounds that we've listened to in the class. So let's listen to the group. So good, uh, good practice for you is to play the sound when you get the video and then see if you can pick each individual bird out. Sometimes that's pretty hard to do, but in this case with the Jays anyway, I think it's fairly similar. Let's try it one more time and see if you can pick out each one as they play, starting with the Blue Jay. I hope that'll work for you and you'll be able to practice and list along, uh, listen along and pick out each individual bird. And then of course you can go and get uh, plenty of bird sounds from the Cornell uh, About Birds site to kind of fill in for the longer sound for each of the birds. So remember the Corvidae, Corvidae, sorry, are loud. They're, pre they're quite raspy. They're not musical at all pretty repetitive. They tend to make the same sound over and over and then maybe go on to something else. The stellar jay is probably the one that does the most varied amount of different sounds and it's pretty good at mimicking. So I've been fooled by it. Uh, uh, it makes a red-tailed uh, hawk sound that's pretty darn good. I've been fooled once by stellar jay. So then the woodpeckers.
Okay, pretty terrible singers. Rasping like the Jays, kind of a hoarse sound and somewhat repetitive with a similar pitch. So let's see. And I was gonna say the white-headed woodpecker, that's that's one that I have a lot of them in my that come to my feeders. And I've learned that they make a sound that's enough different from the hairy woodpecker that you can pick them out pretty quick. They make kind of a, a, a two, sort of a two phrase that at, with a, it's a, a note and then a slightly lower note just following, where the hairy just sticks on one tone. So maybe that'll help you. Let's look at, let's listen to the vireos. We didn't go over all of these vireos. Uh, but this are the, these are the five that can be seen in, in the basin. The ones we went, went over and the most commonly seen here. And uh, they're pretty good singers. First set of good singers that we've had. So the vireos are pretty easy to pick out if you hear them uh, because they have this characteristic, again, a general impression of tone and quality. They have this characteristic of singing a, fra a phrase that's composed of a number of notes and then a little space and they'll sing another phrase of, of several notes and it typically ends on a note that's lower or higher than the phrase just before it. So that's very characteristic of vireos. See if you can pick that out. So I still find those a little bit different to separate. Um, one of the keys that I'm using now is how long is the pause between the phrases? Some of the birds seem to have a shorter or longer pause than the others. So Liz says that a male hooded oriole just flew over to her window. And this was back when we were playing the raven. So she thought, hmm, She's trying to figure out where that, she's trying to figure out where that raven is. So let's move on to nut hatches and the creeper. Um, I say they're similar sounding to woodpeckers, but not a whole lot. Um, they're a little bit more melodious than their songs tend to be. Um, well, well, let's play it and see what you think. I hear the red-breasted nuthatch in my yard a lot, so I've gotten really used to its kind of tin horn sound. Uh, but the white-breasted is one that I heard yesterday, and at first I wasn't sure what it was. In fact, I thought it was a red-breasted, but it, the white-breasted does make this kind of um, almost laughing sound. Let's try it. It'll be the second one in the bunch here. But it sounds like he's laughing at us, the white-breasted. Of course, the pygmy is that high-pitched toot, and you hear typically a whole bunch of them together because they're pretty gregarious and stick around in flocks. Brown creeper, real high-pitched, doesn't sound like any of the nut hatches. So let's try the wrens.
So the Wrens make nice, nice songs, uh, pretty musical, but in general, they're pretty frenetic and kind of ADD and just a lot of jumbled notes. Not all of them, but uh, a good bit of them. And um, I think I'm looking at this list and the Buicks Wren should be added to the end there. I'll fix that. Uh, so if you hear just a big jumble of kind of musical notes, it's a good guess that it's a wren. So let's listen to it again and see if you can kind of get what I'm talking about. Okay, so Kristen said the pygmy nuthatch sounds like uh, a bush tit. Yes, that uh, that that is yes, very much. Um, and she wonders if if there's bush tits in the basin. Yes, there are. They're they're quite a bit harder to see than the pygmy, um, but they're here. I think they're here. Eh, I don't think they're here for very long. That's the problem. So let's let's uh, listen to the kinglets and the waxwing. I put these together because they have very high pitched sounds in the song somewhere, and of course the uh, waxwings it's just all high pitch. So the waxing wing was at the end there. And uh, this is something you can hear when they're flying. And uh, it's a good clue as to what it is. Right there, it's kind of a buzzy, buggy sound. So the thrushes are our best singers, in my opinion. We're gonna, we're gonna, ex we're gonna reveal our favorite bird song in a minute. Um, but they're great, great singers. They typically have a spiral somewhere in their song, not always. Um, so let's listen, see if you can pick the spiral out and begin to understand what the difference between the hermit and the buried is and the Swainsons especially. The American Robin has a much different sound, but it does have a spiral typically. I hope you can hear that spiral in there. And the warblers, again, excellent singers. Um, and they can be quite similar, but there are subtle differences and it does take a bit of practice for these. Quite often with warblers, they start out with a seesaw, whistled seesaw or slurry seesaw, and then some kind of slurred ending uh, not always slurred, maybe whistled, and it kind of ends in an up or down note or trill. So let's listen to the warblers. So let's try that again. There were a lot of them there. So um, see if you can pick out each, each bird in sequence. It's a good challenge.
Okay, those, those can be a challenge, but very uh, valuable to you if you're in the field and you hear one, then you'll know you want to go, uh, go where it's coming from and make sure to see it. So the cardinality, um, pretty varied sounds. Tanager is burry. The gross beak is clear whistles. The bunting is buzzy whistles. one more time. Okay, you might recall that the tanager and the gross beak and the robin are three that I had you work on because they have some, they have a lot of similarities. But there's just enough difference as you uh, gain some experience with them, you'll be able to hear the difference. So the Western tanager, again, kind of a burry sound, not a pure tone. The gross beak has very pure tones that it sings, whistled tones. And the lazuli is a little bit buzzy. And again, it makes a unique sound at the end of a phrase. Okay, then last were the sparrows, and we had a lot of sparrows, of course, and I think they're our best singers, actually, and not all of them, the Chipping Sparrow is, uh, and that's not much of a song, but the Brewer's, Brewer Sparrow is pretty impressive, so let's listen to the sparrows, see if you can pick out each one as it goes through. Okay, let's try that uh, one more time. I'm thinking I left the, uh, oops, let's go back. Looks like I left the green tail toey off the list. I, th I thought I heard it there. Let's listen one more time. Chipping Sparrow. Bruce. Vesper. Savannah. Fox. Tom. Lincoln. White Crown. Junko, spotted, and I'm pretty sure that was a green-tailed towie on the end there. So that's the end of our review. Again, I'll make a video of this that'll have all the song, songs included for all these review slides. So I spent uh, a lot of time because I was really interested in knowing how birds are named. So if they seem to be named after something or someone, then I would look it up and try to include it on the slide. And so then I came to wonder, well, just how do you get yourself pasted onto a bird name? Uh, needless to say, that's pretty difficult these days, but there are a couple of ways that could work. So clearly the best way was to know John James Audubon in the old days, and he might name a bird after you. And then, of course, Lewis and Clark got to name quite a few birds, but 
unfortunately you won't be able to take a hike with those guys anymore. Uh, now this one is actually possible. If you're on the committee that decides about splitting species, then I think you have an opportunity to name, you know, if they split a bird into two species and you'll have an opportunity to name that new second species. And then lastly, which I think is still possible, there are birds that still haven't been discovered, not many, but there are a few. And so you really have to be in kind of a remote snake and blood sucking creature filled place and hang around there. So I don't know about you, but I don't plan to do any of these, but I do find the naming quite interesting. So this is an important part of the class. And I wanted to present it now because partly because I just took a class by Tom Stevenson and he got me thinking more about the, these memory tips. He's the co-author of the Warbler Guide. It's really an excellent book, but it's very dense. I'm not sure you would include it as one of your first bird books. Uh, however, if you want to get it, and he does talk a lot about these memory tips in there, and he talks about how to describe bird sounds by breaking them up into um, pieces. And he describes what the pieces look like and sound like, and he has spectrograms for all the birds, but it's just warblers. So you can get a 30% discount these days, and there's the link. Uh, so his book divides bird songs into three pieces. He calls them elements, phrases, and sections. And understanding these can aid in retention because you might remember, well, that bird has exactly two elements and three phrases, that kind of thing. So other tips by Tom that I found really compelling was to create a story in your mind that recalls the sound and links it to what the bird looks like. So let's take an example of the prairie warbler. So now you can hear the song going up. Each, each phrase seems to be at a little bit higher pitch until he starts over. So Tom came up with this story, and it's that when you hear this song, which is going up, so you remember walking up a hill in the prairie and seeing a prairie warbler. So that may or may not be useful to you, but I think those kinds of stories are very, very good. It's helpful if you can make up your own story, though. He had many, many elaborate stories. Some were just outrageously too elaborate, I thought. But he says the more elaborate, the better for your memory. Well, actually meant, on, meant to go on to the next slide. Let's try that again. All right. So he, he suggests and I've heard this mentioned other places, that's why I put it down here, that you work on four or five bird songs at a time, not a whole bunch of them. And very key, you don't wanna be able to see what the bird is while you're playing it. Because if you know what the bird is and then you play the sound, then your, your mind will get lazy on you and uh, it won't work very hard to remember that. So hide the information until you've decided what bird it is and then you can look. Another thing he suggested, which I haven't done, but a good idea, is to play the songs in a different order each time, so randomize them. And then he says, do two sessions each day of five to 10 minutes each. And then you'll change to a new set of birds once you attain reliable identification. And then my suggestion is you create a story for the ones that are difficult for you. Some of them will be pretty easy. Like, I don't think I need a story for the red-breasted nuthatch. It sounds like a tin horn all the time, pretty much. And, uh, but there are some that are really difficult. Against the fox sparrow, the green-tailed towhee, lazuli bunting, all of those have been difficult for me. So I think I need to work on my stories for them. 
Here's another one that he came up with. Let's listen to the black-throated blue warbler. Now, I bet you can hear it saying, I am lazy in there. So his story, I'm a lazy person in a blue blazer with a white handkerchief. And that helps him to remember. So I hope those are good tips. And Liz says in the Warbler Guide, he suggests a story for every warbler. So that could be helpful to you in figuring out how you can come up with a story on your own by looking at some of his, perhaps. Now there are six video lessons that Tom did, and you could get to them by using that link. They're very short, they're like three or four minutes each. And he shows spectrograms and he talks a bit about uh, the phrases and the elements. So you might find those helpful. I haven't done them all yet, but I, I plan to. I am lazy. So, what are our favorite bird sounds? So uh, I, don't wanna, I do want to mention Sarah Hackensmith again. She was, she was very helpful in developing this, this class, but she wasn't able to uh, attend. She wanted to be part of the presentation, but um, TENS, like a lot of nonprofits, are having trouble with, uh, with, with funding these days. And they, they did line up some paid for bird surveys. So she's been going out at the crack of dawn pretty much every day and staying out all day. So hers is the hermit thrush. So that's really beautiful, I have to admit. A beautiful lead-in tone in the spiral, pretty amazing. But mine is the is the yellow-headed blackbird. So I'll go my out of my way to see these guys, uh, so I can just hear them. Now, what do you think? That's pretty weird, otherworldly almost. So I'm having trouble imagining how it even makes that sound. Well, it turns out I do have a not favorite, and it's the cliff swallow. Let's see if you can see why that is. All right, <laughs> a bit of like fingers on the, on the whiteboard, right? Or blackboard, I guess it would have been. Well, the good news is it's really distinctive. So let's see. Now, Linda is asking, where are they found? And I'm guessing maybe you meant the hermit thrush? Well, in the woods, pretty hard to find. Your best bet is to hear them and then go find them. Uh, and the yellow-headed blackbird is found in the basin. They're typically in a reedy, marshy area. So that's a good place to find them. They're very distinctive, fairly large birds with that big yellow, yellow head and breast on them. Um, Bambi says, oh, we're, we're a good place to start birding in the basin. Well, I think one of the, one of the best, although it's somewhat under construction right now is it's called Cove East, and you enter it by going into the Tahoe Keys area, and you park the car along the road there, and then you'll see the sign for Cove East. That's a good one because it has marshy areas, and it has lakefront. Um, some shorebirds can be seen. It has a fair amount of woods, 
So that's one of our favorites. Uh, I go to Rabe Meadows, which is in State Line, and it's, it's a pretty walk. I think there are less birds to be seen than at Cove East, but it's a really beautiful walk. You can walk all the way, all the way out to the lake if you want to. And then there are many more places. Um, I suggest maybe looking at eBird and see where the hot spots are around the lake. Um, let's see. I could try to come up with a list of hot spots and put it in the put it in the slides here, so you'll have a copy of it when I produce that set for you. So I'll, I'll see what I can do to list some hot spots. Oh, well, didn't mean to play it again. I have to admit that PowerPoint has been the most challenging thing for me with this. Uh, and it's all because of one little thing they claim is a feature, which is they make the cursor disappear after three seconds. Boop, see that? Now I can't, I don't know where it is. Uh, it's a real pain. I've asked them to fix it, but I have not much hope of that. So we're planning on doing another session of four classes in the spring of 2021. And uh, so there'll be another 50 birds in the basin from the groups that you can see there. So we had hoped to do this in person and hopefully we'll be able to do that in which case I think it would be two classes of two hours each. So here are the resources. You've seen this a lot. So I just wanted to mention a few things. One is if you're trying to think of mnemonics for the bird sounds like zedel zedel or something like that, I found the Stokes Field Guide to be the one that had the most um, this, the best set of mnemonics that I could relate to. And then uh, a good CD to start with is this one. And uh, you can get it at Amazon. Last time I looked, they said they were almost out, but more were coming. And then if you want to do your own spectrograms, Raven Light is free. So let's All right, I'm gonna start the poll. This will be a new poll this time. So appreciate it if you would take it and give me some feedback. I'm gonna launch it right now. So Sandra wonders how we can get a notification for the spring class. Uh, that's a good question. I think what I'll have to do is because I'm sure not all of you are members of Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, then I'll just mail out a list, uh, an email to all of the people on the list that signed up for the class. I'll be sure and do that. Uh, so Let's see, one person said the bird song CD is taking a while to get through Amazon. It's been a week. She, she's still waiting for it. So be patient. Meanwhile, for your homework now, now that you're on your own, work on your stories and keep practicing. I'll send out the video with sound from the review slides. So you'll have that as kind of a key. Again, you can get free bird sounds from the Cornell Lab. Always good to have more than one bird in your, um, one, more than one bird of a uh, species to listen to. And consider co contributing to our host, Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. Uh, you can be a member for $35. And there is the $300 challenge match that extends through August. So anything you contribute up to $300 would be matched.
So that's all I've got. If you have any questions, let's see them in the chat window. We've got a few more minutes. So Samia, I hope I'm saying that correctly, says she recommends the Merlin Bird ID app. That would be for your phone. And it helps you ID birds because what you do is uh, I've used it uh, in the office some. Let's see, I've used it. What you do is put down a couple of general things like where did you see it? And then you try to describe it by color, size and shape. And then it'll tell you what it's likely to be. Any other questions? Thank you, Tim. That would be fun. So you can see by the poll that we're thinking about um, doing a bird sounds walk uh, in the basin. And uh, if we can get enough interest, we might try to do that. But next spring would be the best time. Uh, the classes aren't released yet, I'm sorry to say. Um, in fact, it would, I've been pressing uh, Will. Will Richardson is the executive director and co-founder of TENS. And he's the guy that makes that decision. So I've been asking him and asking him with not much back. They're very busy this time of year. So if you would like to see the classes with the sound, the full class on YouTube, he said he's going to do it, but what he needs is a little bit of a prodding to get that done. So feel free to give him an email. And I think, uh, let me see if I can, well, I'll send out his email in the uh, follow-up follow uh, email message that I sent to you. What's his name? Will Richardson. And you can find him on the TENS website. Type in Tahoe Institute for Natural Science in Google and you'll find it right away. Okay, we're just about out of time. Just a few more questions. All right, I'll end the poll here and I'm gonna share the result with you. So you can see what it looks like. I haven't seen all of these yet, so. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for participating in the class and in the poll, especially. And I hope to talk to you soon uh, in our second session of this set of classes. So long.